when uh, when Miko uh, was thinking about the uh, the telecell project, he he believed in it, but nobody else believed in the project, including us in the company who were working for for him in other sector of the activities. You know, he had that time. Um, a managing director was a French guy who clearly told him that uh, he had no time to deal with this, this telephone uh, project. So Miko had to do it himself. And um, when he put the business plan together, now he started uh, trying to find partners. And believe me, in Congo that time, the people had money. All the doors he knocked, they didn't include in the project. Only one man, and that man is in this room, Joe Gatt. <laughs> Only Joe Gatt believed in him and uh, started the project with him and uh, developed friendship, and that's why he's here. He is always participating on the family event. All of them I've ever seen, I always find Joe Gatt there. So he's here. <laughs> as a partner, as a friend, as uh, one of the persons who has been the closest to me. Thank you. I'm, I'm being reminded that he is white brother. <laughs> As I look around, I see clearly <coughs> that not everyone here would remember the year of 1977. <laughs> this was an important year. You see, in 1977, I was a big shot. I was president of an airline. I knew presidents, ministers, and top executives. I had risen the ladder of a major corporate success. Surely, I had nothing more to learn from anyone. And then, something happened. Something so big that over the next 30 years, I realized how truly I really knew and how much I had yet to learn. That's when I met Miko Waitere. At the time, I was CEO of Ezeir. As you know, everywhere in the world, CEO means Chief Executive Officer. But Miko would prove to me that it stood much more for the way he maybe a thousand times described it to me. And to this day, I'm not sure he was kidding when he said, CEO stands for completely erroneous and overpaid. <laughs> I met Miko when, I was, when he was the distributor of Hewlett Packard in Kinshasa and had just won the award to install a computer system in our airline. This alone tells you a lot about him. He had an engineering degree he had earned in Germany as a young man. Then he applied for and was appointed as a distributor of Hewlett Packard. And then without such any political connections, remember, I was CEO. I had not even met him. He made a successful bid for the airline's computer system. Not an easy trick when it was a world of who you know rather than what you know. That never got in his way. <coughs> but then he already had the right kind of track record. A track record of hard work, perseverance, and an attitude there's nothing I cannot accomplish. I believe that all of you are enjoying the fruits of your accomplishments <coughs> and talents. He already know exactly what that means. I was curious who this person who won the award to install the computers. So when my staff told me that he, as the winning vendor, insisted on meeting me, I was happy to have dinner 
with him near my offices in Kinshasa. At the very first dinner, it became obvious that Mika and I shared values, some very important values. Three values, actually. The first two were Bordeaux, red and white. <laughs> and the third was champagne. <laughs> that quickly led to another of the key business traits that characterized Miko, friendship. Not the superficial kind, but the real kind, where Miko's family became my family, and my family became his. As a matter of fact, today, at her insistence, my daughter Sharon, who grew up with Miko, insisted on coming here instead of going to an important event that she had in California. This was more important to her. But not long after my airline decided that since the planes I was in charge of did not seem to be falling out of the sky, they would try me in building and managing their hotels with the hope that they would not fall down with me as head of that operation. This took me away from DRC, or Zaire at the time, but on each trip, my friendship with Miko just seemed to grow naturally and effortlessly, pretty much like the natural forest here. There was no need for any real effort. I had already gotten to know Miko. Miko's insatiable intellectual appetite for everything new, new technology, new gadgets, for new adventures, for looking behind the idea tree, and the next tree, and the next. So about six years into our friendships, I wasn't surprised when he proposed to me what undoubtedly was the most stupid, absurd, ridiculous idea I had ever heard. You see, Miko had again done what was very dangerous for him to do, very dangerous. And I had, I had always <coughs> tried to warn him. But he did it anyway. He read about something new, and he just could not stop believing that he could make it happen. I'm referring, and perhaps many of you can surmise, the cell phone <coughs> technology that first appeared in the 1980s. Miko read about it and simply decided before I could try to stop him, that he and I were going to make it happen, that we would bring cell phones to, of all places, Africa. <laughs> Keep in mind, at that time, the cell phone was a toy of the American rich. It cost $3,000. It was the size of a brick. <laughs> People didn't even know what to do with them, except take them somewhere outside to call a friend and say, hey, Guess how I'm calling you. Guess where I am. <laughs> Here's how I personally knew that the cell phone was more expensive than anything that ever could put into an African economy at the time. At that time, all my lawyers were from big New York uh, firms. And when I asked them about cell phones, they said they couldn't afford it. Now, if lawyers of New York can afford something, who can? <laughs> 